Lord. That's a good song of triumph, isn't it? And may it be so. Everybody say, Amen. I mean, so be it, so be it. Yeah, I love, that's one of my favorite words, amen. That's when people say, you know, hey, you hear something you agree with, something that touches your heart, something that you say, boy, that's the truth of the word of God. What comes after that out of your mouth ought to be amen. <laughs> or if you're a Presbyterian or Episcopal or, or Lutheran or whatever you might be, or you were born on the west coast of the country, seems like the east coast more amen like we're just a little bolder, a little more brash, you know, especially if you're born in the South as a Baptist or a, you know, a, a, a shouting Methodist or some, some little more flamboyant forward kind of people. It's like, amen, amen, you know. If you're a little bit more reserved and a little bit more liturgical and all that, it's, you know, amen, amen, you know, kind of deal. But at the end of a prayer, you say, amen. Why? Because you're saying, so be it. And then if you hear something that grabs your heart and you want to agree with and this total truth, amen, so be it. And I agree with that. And may God's power be released in that. So if you want to, if you want to fire your preacher up, give me an amen every once in a while. I mean, I don't want to be thinking I'm up here by myself. You know, it's <laughs> really what I, I heard somebody say. I heard somebody say, uh, he was talking about being a preacher, and he said, man, told his congregation, say, man, don't you, you know, don't you know that saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him, sick him to a bulldog? And the congregant that really would, had gotten quiet and had moved from the front row to the back row and didn't ever say amen anymore, he said, why don't you do that, man? It's, when you say amen, it's like saying sick him to a bulldog. He said, I know, pastor, but it's hard to say sick him when he's got you by the seat of the pants, you know what I mean? <laughs> So anyway, anyway, some of you might be moved from the front, uh, you know, and if we had some chairs out there for you in the cafe, you'd be in it, you know, you moved all the way back out. But uh, I'm encouraging you, man, you know, if you agree with something, if you hear something that touches your heart or something, you say that's the truth of the word of God. What goes there is an amen, amen, amen. So it may, it, may it be so, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but when messages happen in the church, you're part of it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. Depending on who's here and what God needs for you to hear, he inspires a line, a line of revelation or a line of speaking to you that because you're here and he wants you to hear that, I mean, it might be that I kind of go off into some little something that's not maybe for everybody else. It's just for you that God knows you need to hear that or he's going to use that to speak to you in ways that, it, that, the, that the Spirit's going to hone in on you and go, boom, if you weren't here, I might not chase that rabbit down that rabbit hole because nobody else needs it, but because you're here, here the rabbit goes, and here I go with him, and then, you know, just hopefully, hopefully we can always run the rabbit around and come back, you know, and catch him at the end. It's not bad to run a rabbit as long as you catch him, you know. <laughs> you know? So anyway, I don't even know why I went off into that, but there you go. I want to I mention something to you, and then I'm going to ask Wesley to come up, and he's going to share just a little quick testimony, because uh, I'm going to say this about right now and the days to come. Because last week, at one little point in the message, toward the end of the message, I kind of jaunted off into um, some, something that maybe to some of you might have felt a little uncomfortable, and it just shows you what a carnal world we live in and a people-pleasing world we live in, that our, our attitude about the truth of the Word of God, we're a little bit kind of kind of spongy about the fact that somebody might stand up and say, this is the truth of the word of God, and it goes against somebody else's religion or somebody else's belief system or somebody else's, you know, what they, what they believe is true. But here's my opinion, and I'm going to tell you what's going to, have to, what's going to happen in the future. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe the Spirit of God fills me and speaks through me, and I'm responsible to the Word of God through the Spirit of God to speak to you. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly and vile. I'm not trying to be accusatory or judgmental or harsh. But Jesus Christ says in his own word, I am the way, not one of many ways. He said, I am the way. That means anybody that does not go to God through Jesus Christ is lost. It means they're going the wrong way. They are not finding the way. 
So whether it be some ism that ought to be a wasm, whether it be some magical occultism, whether it be some crazy religion that follows some, uh, some other book or some other direction, which the world is full of those kind of religions that follow people that are supposed prophets and blah, blah, and blah, blah. The word of God is the only source of dynamic truth in this world. And the word of God is absolute, right? Somebody said, her, I heard you say absolute, and that's, it, that's the truth. It is absolute. And unless you think Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about or that Jesus would lie, the very words of Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So every other way is false. It is contrary to the scripture. It is anti-Christ. And I don't know about you, I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus and everything that doesn't exalt Jesus, but makes Jesus some kind of good guy, but he's some kind of prophet. He's some kind of, he's on the, he's on the level with another, some of these teachers, these you know, these uh, supposed uh, men led, you know, the Buddhas and the Mohammeds and the, all that kind of stuff of the world, the Confucius and all of those kind of things in the world, those are contrary to Jesus Christ, so they are the enemy of Christ. And when I come across the word of God that basically says, look at this because this is dangerous to the kingdom of God, it is my responsibility as a man of God, led by the Spirit of God, to, to tell you how things are. I'm not trying to do it to hurt anybody's feeling or to create some kind of avalanche against somebody's heart. I'm, I'm responsible to the Word of God. And if I didn't believe that Jesus was the king of the creation and I believed in the Word of God, then I don't need to be up here speaking and preaching to you because he's my king and the word of God is my source book and anything that comes against that, uh, they're enemies. Enemies of the cross is what Jesus says. And so what do you do? You love people, you try to win people, you try to be kind to people and gracious to people, but you can't, you know, you can't deny the truth and the reality of the word of God and it, it just represents the fact that we feel uncomfortable about those things shows the sponginess of our society and how we've just been slowly, slowly walked through a series of events that have made us uncomfortable with some of these uh, crazy cultic ideas and, and, and have convinced us that we don't need to speak against them while the devil's using that to lead millions and millions of people away from Christ and straight to hell. So our charge is wake up. Break out of that mess. Call a, you know, call call the truth the truth. Let the word of God stand and let the Spirit of God empower the Word of God and convict the people in their heart. And with that thought in mind, let me just show you. Last week I spoke about ten sentences about something that came right out of the Word of God and and it sounded, you know, I'm, I'm coming against some of these religions, a different kind of religions and so forth. And I don't know if you, if you even sensed that or felt like when I was saying it, you're going, oh my goodness, he's in trouble now because this thing's going viral and blah, blah, blah. But let me just show you what happens. And I'm just going to tell you this. If you felt uncomfortable with those 10 sentences last week, you gotta, you, you're not going to feel comfortable with the rest of this word now because it gets way worse than that. I mean, that's only a little flicker of what God's going to say to this kind of create craziness that we live in, and it's going to be deep and tough. I guarantee you we have about 20, we have about 20, well, 18 more chapters that go way against that kind of stuff, and I'm going to talk about everybody in the world, including us as Christians, all right? So, you know, if you're a little squeamish and all that, you're probably the very one that needs to hear that. Yeah, if you feel a little nervous about it, oh, pastor, don't say that. We'll have people picketing outside. Well, whatever. I mean, I'm 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 supposed to I'm supposed to tell the truth. I mean, you know you you know what you know what chapters two and three in Revelation are right. Chapters two and three in Revelation is Jesus said, "Let me tell you how things are." And he doesn't pull any punches, and he doesn't hold anything back. And he said, let me tell you just like it is. He told John, he said, you tell them just how it is. And he used seven churches as displays of how things are. 
He says, this is how things are, and then it's like this, and then it's like this. I don't know if you've noticed it, but as he's walked through these seven letters to seven churches, prophetically speaking, he says, this is how church life was in the beginning. Then it fell into this phase, and then it fell into this phase, and then it fell into this phase. It started off like the church in Ephesus. It had great uh, teaching, great doctrine, great scripture, but, they, but their hearts began to get cold, and they left their first love. And then we moved to Smyrna, where the Roman government was persecuting the church, and it was the suffering church, and this corresponds with an age in history where the church was persecuted, and the Roman government had the heavy hand on them, and they were, you know, they were just boom, and then Constantine came along, and, and, and the church at Pergamos was born, where the church marries the world and becomes the religion of the Roman Empire, and so it begins to change the nature of the church, and people that don't even know the Word of God begin to be in charge, and so the church marries the world, and it starts starts becoming looser and more idolatrous. And then that leads us to the church at Thyatira, which is the church of the dark ages. And it was the church that didn't have any light, didn't have, know any doctrine, and it just was totally blind and all of those kind of things. And then out of that deadness came even a deader situation where the church in Sardis, Jesus looked at him and said, you know, you're dead. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. But he said, even at Sardis, there are a few who haven't defiled their, their garments. So there began to be a little smoldering fire, a little flicker that God's Holy Spirit blew on and some fans, you know, a few coals that began to flame up and reformers and people who were sick of the deadness began to flame out a little bit and move out, you know. And then that led, of course, to the church at Philadelphia, which we looked at last week, which is a church that was on fire, the church that was a revival. You know what comes out of deadness? You know what comes out of just pure darkness? Uh, people who have a passionate heart for God begin to be sick of what's going on, and they say, come out here and let me teach you a little bit about the Word of God. And where, where they were drone in their way through church services with hummy, hummo, hum, blah, 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 get down, get up, get down, get up, blah, 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 blah. speaking in Latin and some kind of crazy languages most of them couldn't understand out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And everybody going, what in the world is this mess? And they walked out just as dead as they walked in because church meant nothing to them. There were some people sitting out there going, what in the world is this? Come over to my house, man. I, was, I, I, got, I got something I want to show you in the scripture. They'd come out, and man, those people would be a little passionate, a little excited, a little, let me tell you that Jesus is king. This is the word of God. And the people like Charles Wesley started writing songs about Jesus, and John Wesley began to preach about Jesus, having these home meetings and these meetings at little storefronts, and people coming in, and they could feel the passion that these Wesley boys had. And then Moody started preaching in these big things and starting Sunday school classes on the streets of Chicago and the YMC. A young men's Christian association was born to be a Sunday school outreach to the little vagabond kids on the streets of Chicago to say, come in here and play basketball and then I'm gonna have a devotion with you about Jesus. And then that, that spirit of that passion began to flame up in the church in Philadelphia and the spirit's going, go, 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 go. And then Tory starts preaching over there in England and Jonathan Edwards preaches sinners in the hand of an angry God and people just run down the aisle and Billy Sunday, that crazy guy, boy, if you want to read somebody that was the start of something wild, Billy Sunday was a baseball player and, they, and, and, they, and he'd put up big tents and invite people, come in and let me preach to you about the word of God, man, and passion was beginning to flow. Why? It was out of the deadness of everything else that people got hungry for some life. And he began to preach, man. He would run. He, this is how he would enter every service, man. He, would, he had a sawdust aisle right down here, and he would take off running, all, and he'd run all the way around the church, run all the way around the church, come down the center aisle, and he would slide in like a baseball player to the altar, and he would go safe with Jesus. And then, and then it would really get passionate after that. But it was out of the deadness of what came before that all these reformers and revile and, 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 uh, and, and performers and spirits and passion became. Jonathan Edwards was a Presbyterian preacher that couldn't even half see. I mean, here, he wrote great things. Here's how, Jonathan, here's how Jonathan Edwards would preach his sermon. I'm serious. He was a little, little bitty short guy. 
had on thick bottle glasses. He didn't have any personality or charisma. He was just, you know, just a little bitty short guy that didn't have any personality, didn't care. And, 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 and he wrote great things. But when he preached, here's, here's how he would preach. He, he would be looking at what he wrote. And he'd be just like this. He'd have the book right up in front of him like that. And he'd be saying, in each of these letters to the church, seven churches, John uses a direct quote. Or, um, that's how he preached. And he preached a famous sermon that was called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And, and according to the testimonies of the people that were there, before he even got finished with his sermon, people were running down the aisles, weeping and wailing and saying, God, forgive me, a sinner. God. I mean, and, and, and he had no, no performance, no, you know, no passion really about, I mean, he was just reading what he wrote and it had the word of God in it. And man, the spirit of God was so heavy on the people that it just, man, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but it was out of the deadness that came before that the passion of God. And I'm just saying to you, if you look at society, it always happens this way. It is out of the deadness of the former generation, the confusion and the idiocy and the lunacy of former generations that disavow greatness and so forth, that cause a revolt in the passionate, hot-hearted people that make room for reformation to move forward in life. And whether you're talking about government or whether you're talking about the church or you're talking about some group in society, the deadness of the former generation paves the way for the passion of the new generation. And the church in Philadelphia is the revival age of the church. <laughs> But then, of course, the danger of that is that people get complacent, say fat, happy, and sassy. Fat, happy, and sassy. I'm gonna, you know what the greatest enemy of the Holy Spirit of God is? You say the greatest enemy of the, of the Holy Spirit of God is, you know, is, is, is sin. No, it's not. It, 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 it's being satisfied. It's complacency. And nothing so tests your Christianity like prosperity. I mean, hey, look, let me, let me show you. You got a job. You make, you know, uh, $50 a week. Your tithe is $5. You bring your little $5 bill up here, which is 10% of $50 a week salary. It's not hard to put $5 in the offering plate. I doesn't even hurt. I barely hurts, you know. But all of a sudden, you get a promotion. You're making five thousand dollars a week. I guarantee you, taking five hundred of it a week and coming putting it in here, all of a sudden hurts a lot more. And you're beginning to think, I don't need that money. I mean, my goodness, man, five hundred dollars a week. Who gives five hundred dollars a week, man? Come on, that's a lot of money. But only because you've been prosperous does that matter anymore. And now what is testing you is, am I going to be obedient with 5,000 just like I was with 50? You see, what's happened is your prosperity has encouraged you to walk away from God. So nothing so tests Christianity like prosperity. When you're struggling and hurting and lost and, and defeated and downgraded and sick and miserable and wretched and blind and everything else, and the Holy Spirit moves to tell you that. And you fall on your knees. Oh, God, forgive me, a sinner. Forgive me, a sinner. Oh, God. Oh, God, forgive me, a sinner. And you seek God because of the poverty and the depravity and the weakness and the failure of your life. But when you fat, happy, and sassy, and nobody's repossessing your car, and you can pay your cable bill, and the power's on, and the air conditioner's running, you laying on the couch with a sack of pig skins on your stomach, you know, drinking chocolate milk and watching some kind of ball game, nobody can tell you anything. You start feeling convicted, you say, I need a few more carbs, bring me a bag of potato chips. <laughs> and you lazy yourself and complacent yourself right into the pit. Hmm. Some, some crazy religion knocks on your door, tries to come in and convince you to be a part of a cult somewhere. 
You don't have enough of the Word of God to even challenge that. They leave you some piece of paper and you give them $25 for the effort of them coming to the store because that piece of paper says if you'll, if you'll contribute, you'll get a place in heaven. And instead of booting them off your doorstep or trying to use the Word of God to combat their silly foolishness, you'll contribute to it and, and, and think you did something good. All you did is contribute some part of the kingdom of God to some cult that is anti-Christ, that is actually against who you say is the king of your life. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. And if you're not against me, you're for me. So the things that are against Christ in this world are the enemies of Christ. And they're your enemy too. If you, if you believe that Jesus is Christ and he's the only way, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus clearly claimed to be the only begotten Son of God. There's not another one. There's not an alternative. All of this crazy junk being perpetrated on TV about Jesus being born in heaven with a brother who that brother became Lucifer is hogwash. There's nothing in the Bible that tells you anything like that. Jesus was not created by God. Jesus was not birthed in heaven as a son of God. He is the son of God. He is co-equal with God. He is eternal like God. Do you know what eternal means? It means doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. You are not eternal. You are everlasting. And Jesus always says, I'll give you everlasting life, which means God is eternal. He never had a beginning and he never has an end. But you had a beginning, but you never have an end, so you're not eternal. You're everlasting. Jesus is eternal. He is God. How do you explain that? I have no idea. I can use all kinds of analogies of water, steam, and ice. They're all three water, but they're different formations of it, you know, kind of word pictures like that to, to define the Spirit of God and Jesus Christ and God the Father, but it still doesn't explain it. It just kind of illustrates it. I don't know how to explain it. All I say is when you get to heaven, you'll know, Okay. Because the Bible says in, in, in Corinthians, when you get there, he says, you will know as you are known. Let me ask you, what's known about you? How much does God know about you? He knows everything. So when you get to heaven, he says, you will be like me, which means you're going to know everything. So when you get to heaven, you're not going to walk up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, I've been confused about this all my life. Can you explain this to me? Like I've heard a lot of people say, man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask you. No, 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 you're not. When you get to heaven, you're going to know it. Because I would hate to think I know. You know, somebody says, well, well am I going to know my mom and my daddy when I get to heaven? Am I going to know my best friend? Pastor, am I going to know you? Well, I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask you this question. Do you think you know more in your unglorified body than you will know in your glorified body? Well, you know me in your unglorified body. You think you're going to be dumber in your glorified body than you are in your un... No, I'm just saying that sure you're going to know me. Now, you're not going to recognize me maybe right off the bat because I'm going to have a lion's mane shaking down like that. And you're going to say, Pastor, is that you? And I'm going to say, show sure enough. And you're going to go, whoa, what an improvement. But that will be all right because I'm going to have a crown to lay at Jesus' feet up here or two. I mean, there are five of them in the Bible. I'd love to have like five of them stacked up on my head. Because the more I can give Jesus, the more joy is going to be released in heaven. My goodness. And you're going to have one too. You're going to have at least one. If you're a Christian, you're, the crown of righteousness is going to be on your head because the Spirit has saved your soul and there will be one little righteous crown. But there are four more in the marketplace, now ripen, there's a work for us to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little as much if God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name.
Yeah, yeah, praise. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, oh, don't encourage him. He'll do it again. <laughs> don't encourage him. He gets fired up. But I'm just saying that there's a soul winner's crown. It's called the crown of rejoicing. There's the martyr's crown called the crown of life. You know, there's the uncorruptible crown, which is for those who stay true to the word in spite of all of the de degradation around them, you know. And there's the, there's the, the crown of glory, which is, the, which is the pastor's crown who get, you get for ministering the word of God and the kingdom of God. <laughs> holy, holy, man. Get the, get the crowns. Get the crowns. Don't let somebody win the crown. You don't win it. There are plenty of them to go around. I mean, he's not taking somebody else's and then giving you something that belongs to somebody else. He's got plenty of them. And there's no reason, you know, there's no reason for you not to have a bunch of them to lay at Jesus' feet. But anyway, I was going to call Wesley up, and I still am. Come up here, Wesley. <laughs> come here, Wesley. See, you thought, you thought that rabbit wouldn't come back around, didn't you? Yeah. Here he is, right. Here he is. And, and now Wesley's just a regular worker you know, in, a, in, a, in an industry in this, on the Gulf Coast. And this is one of the things. I just want you to hear this so you'll, you'll be able to know this. All right, tell them, Wesley, what it is. I'm going to stand next to you so you, uh, you can pick up, okay? Um, I give, uh, uh, send the uh, messages from YouTube to a friend of mine. And he uh, sent it to a, a Muslim faith friend of his, not friend, his cousin. And um, all week throughout this last week, he's wants more and more and more and more and by friday i got the word from my friend at work that uh he wants to know more and more and he's watched all these videos and he <laughs> wants to convert from uh muslim faith to christianity yeah hallelujah i just wanted to share that <laughs> real quick and it's 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 all because he this is his words it's all because of the word of god through this man right here Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Woo. Thank you, Wesley. Wesley. Wesley came in prayer meeting Wednesday night, and he, said, he was telling me, he said, man, I can't believe what you did last Sunday. And he said, you know that's going viral. He said, you know, because, I mean, in this age of I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, aren't we? You know, in this age where we're taught not to offend people and not to say things like this, in this age of political correctness and blah, 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 you're not supposed to say negative things about somebody's religion because, after all, they have the right to believe what they want to believe. Well, that's absolutely true. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But if you don't believe the Bible, you're wrong. I mean, you have the right to be ignorant if you want to be ignorant. And you can go, go to hell you know, because you won't believe the truth. You have every right to do that. Yeah, right. Town's full of good old boys that believe ignorance, and they're going to hell when they die. But my job as a minister of the gospel is to love Christ and love the Word and preach the truth. What do you think the letters to the seven churches is all about? The letters to the seven churches are not historical documents so that you can ride along and understand what history is. I mean, some of you love history, and I do too, and it's nice to see some of it and, it, and it really, you know, it really confirms the Word of God because you can see it as it marches through history, and you say, man, that opens up some understanding to me. Well, great. That's a great thing, and I'm glad you're touched by history validating the Word of God, but that's not why the seven letters were written. The seven letters were written so that let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of God says, and he who has eyes see what the Spirit of God says, so you can be challenged by the Holy Spirit of God to receive the message that each one of these letters to the seven churches brings you personally in life. So the Holy Spirit can challenge you to get off your pity pot, to get off your complacency, to get off the blindness that you got in, quit feeling like a victim and you got to do that, and realize you're a son of the king of God and you're an ambassador in heaven and God's marching order is forward march. Let's go. The world's coming to an end. And this is how things are, and you have only a few days left, and the door is going to be closed. And if you love people, you love your family, you love your neighbors, and you care about the souls of men, you'll get out there with the marching orders of God and challenge the lostness of this world. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will go with you. 
And the Holy Spirit will convict hearts and convince hearts. Wesley shared about a guy watching these messages over the internet. And, and I mean, I don't even know him. He doesn't know me or anything. All, but all I can tell you is when the Word of God is spoken by the man of God and the Holy Spirit takes the light of God and opens the Word of God with it, conviction comes to those who will listen to God. And my responsibility is not to pat people on the back and slobber on people and love on people and tell them it's okay. My job is to tell them how it is. Because that's what the things that are is all about. Let me tell you, according to Revelation, let me open up to you the way the way what you have seen, which is Jesus Christ magnified, glorified as the Savior of the world. Chapter 1 is all about it. Now in chapters 2 and 3, tell them how things are. Then in chapter 4, he's going to say, now tell them how things are going to be in the future. So just like God told John, my responsibility is tell them the way it is and don't pull any punches. And don't try to be politically correct and quit worrying about hurting somebody's feelings. It's my responsibility to preach the word. It's your responsibility to receive the word like it is everybody else's. And so if you feel uncomfortable, I'm sorry that it makes you feel uncomfortable, but, but the kingdom of God is a disturbing thing. It'll disturb you. The picture of Jesus knocking on the door of my heart is that Christ is the disturbing Christ. You're laying on your, you're laying on your couch with a bag of pig skins on your stomach watching a golf tournament through your eyelids and somebody begins to knock on your door. Uh, now you've been disturbed. Well, Jesus said, I'm the disturbing Christ. In your complacency and laziness and sorriness and all of that, I'm standing there knocking, saying, let me in, let me in, let me in. And I'm sorry if that disturbs you. But Christ is trying to change your life and your direction because Jesus loves this world more than he loves himself. And he crucified and died to this world. And part of what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea is just a, a picture of all of this. And let me get into it lest our time run out because it's time to quit, but I'm not quitting for a second, okay? I mean, I'm going to be with you a minute. All right, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? Everybody say, pastor, to the pastor, to the minister, to the angel, to the one who is the messenger of God, to that church, the church of the Laodiceans, which is really appropriate to address them that way. It's like this church is not the church of God in Laodicea, the church of the Spirit in Laodicea. It's the church of the Laodiceans to distinguish the fact that this is not a church responding to God. This is a church of itself. The Laodicea, and I put it in your notes, the word arche, which is a specific Greek word that means no, not RK, but, but that'll be a little bit later. But, but, but the Greek word that is used here to signify the church of the Laodiceans simply means this is a church who has chosen to be of itself. And Laodicea, Laodos, which is where that came from, means people's rights. The church at Laodicea, Laodicea means a church where people rule. So the opposition is, this is not a church where God rules, this is a church where people rule, which is quite appropriate for the church age of Laodicea. And all that means is that the pulpit is led by what the people think and not what God thinks. The pulpit reflects the wishes of society, which is not to offend anybody, to be careful what you say, to not be negative about any of the sin and wickedness and infidelity and lunacy and, and, and cultism and occultism and all of that because the people feel nervous when you start talking like that. So we let the people decide what comes out of the pulpit instead of the Spirit of God. So this is the church of of the Laodiceans, of the people's rights. Not the church of God in Laodicea, but the church of the Laodiceans. These things saith the amen. First title, second title, faithful and true witness. Third title, 
the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you. Listen, there is no more harsh statement made by Jesus in the Word of God about somebody than that. You make me sick, is what he said. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. About the closest thing Jesus ever comes to that is what he says to the Pharisees. You remember what he said? You're like a whitewashed mausoleum. You're like a whitewashed sepulcher. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And the Pharisees said, whoop, that's the last straw, buddy. We got to get rid of you. And then the march to the cross begins, led by religious people. But that wasn't nearly as harsh as him coming up to you and saying, you make me sick. You know what? You make me so sick, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. What a harsh statement. Goes on to say, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched. I believe our young people today to say today would say ratchet. You're ratchet. You're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. I counsel you to buy everybody say from me. From me are the key is the key word there. Jesus said, You gotta buy something from me. What do you want to get from Jesus? Gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as also I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, this is who's speaking to them. This is what Jesus, Jesus identifies himself in three ways. Let me just give them to you quickly. Are you guys getting tired? Okay, okay. I know I've done a lot of preaching already, but I just don't want don't to kill you, you know. But verse 14, I mean, these things are important. Wait till we get, man, we're going to heaven starting next week, you know. I mean, come on, we got to know what this is talking about, right? Revelation means to reveal, to open it up, not to keep it hidden and not to be mysterious. This is intended for you to understand. Tap your neighbor and say, you can understand this. Is there anybody that doesn't understand what we're talking about? I mean, like all the weeks before, you say, I have no idea what any of that stuff meant. Okay, then, then, then I'm doing what I'm supposed to, right? All right, I'm helping you be revealed. The Holy Spirit's working through the man of God to reveal the Word of God that he might inspire the Word of God in you to be different in life. That's what my job is, all right? So let me do it. And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? Jesus said, I'm going to reveal to you, first of all, that I'm the amen. Jesus said, I'm the amen. It's quite interesting that what was wrong with the church of the Laodiceans is they had left the Word of God. They didn't read it. They didn't believe it. They didn't preach it. They didn't, they didn't use it for truth and salvation and all of that. And so Jesus says, you know, I'm going to tell you who I am. And the first revelation of who I am is I am the amen of God. What is he talking about there? He said, I am the so be it of God. I just want you to know that. What does that mean? That means Everything that the Word of God tells you about me, I am sent to be the one that says, so be it. Well, what had been written about the things of God? Start in the Old Testament with the book of Moses. Five, five of the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What they say? One day a Savior is coming. Then you get the history books like the Chronicles and the Kings and the Ruth and the Esther and all, and, 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 the, and, and the history books of the Bible say, the king is coming one day. 
And then the poetry books, you know, all of the Psalms and the Proverbs all the, and the wisdom books, you know, the Ecclesiastes and the, and the Songs of Solomon and all of that kind of stuff. And then the major prophets, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, the Ezekiels and the Daniels, then the minor prophets, the Joels and the Habakkuks and their, you know, and, 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 and Ezra and Nehemiah, all of them, they, you know, what were they saying? The king is coming. And then you come to the New Testament and the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, the king has come. And the letters that the apostle Paul writes, all the Philippians and Colossians and Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus and all of those, the, they say to the church, the king has come. And then you come to Revelation and Jesus says, I'm the amen to everything that has been spoken before. So when he says, I'm the amen, yeah, he's saying, I'm just, I'm the so be it of God. That's who's talking to you. And he said, I'm the faithful and true witness. A faithful witness is someone who does not dilute his testimony. Which means when you call a faithful witness to the stand, the faithful witness is going to just tell you like it is. They're not going to water it down. They're not going to try to lead you in some crazy direction because they have some agenda driven and all of that kind of stuff. They, not, they do not dilute the word. It might hurt your feelings. It might challenge you in some ways that make you angry or whatever it might take, but he tells you like it is. He does not dilute. He is a faithful witness. Secondly, a true witness is somebody that tells the truth and tells all of the truth. A true witness does not hold back part of the truth because it might hurt your feelings. So he's saying, who's talking to you? Who's talking to you is the amen of God, the so be it of God. Everything the word says about me, so be it. And he says, I'm the faithful witness and I'm the true witness. And then he said at the beginning of the creation of God, that's who I am. Now let, you, let me just tell you this. The Jehovah Witness as a religion teach that Jesus was created by God. That Jesus was not in heaven in the beginning, that God actually created Jesus like birthed him as a son in heaven. And whenever and this is one of the passages they use to try to prove that that happened. Because this passage says the Jesus, he said, I, I, I am, I am, uh, I am the Amen of God, and I'm the, I'm the, uh, the faithful and true witness, and I am the beginning of the creation of God. As if I had a beginning and God created me, and then I began to be the the beginning of all the creation of God. But this just shows you how blind and ridiculous religion is. Because when you take an English word in an English-speaking Bible that has a vocabulary meaning in the English Bible, how many of you know the Bible was not spoken in English to be written? The Bible was spoken in Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic. What you have to do if you're going to interpret the Bible, you don't look at an English word that might have multiple meanings. English is a crazy, sorry language. We make stuff up. We create words that don't mean anything. When you say, man, that's bad. Well, what does that mean? Well, it, mean, could, it could mean it's bad, it's a horrible act. Or it could actually mean just the opposite of that. That's great, boy, that's bad, man. It just depends on the inflection of my voice and the release of my continents and all of that kind of stuff because our language is pitiful. I love you. I love pizza. I love my dog. I love my kids. What, what kind of love are you talking about when you as an English-speaking person say the word love? Well, it could mean a bunch of things depending on the context that it's in and the tone of my voice and the look on my face, whether it's a slap or a hug. The Greeks have five words for love, agape, phileo, eros, logos. You know, no, logos is word. Eros, which is not a word that appears in the Bible, but it means erotic love. Phileo means love you like a brother. Agape means uh, love that has no boundaries on it. It's a very precise language. It uses words that mean precisely some things. That's why God inspired it in a language like that. 
so we wouldn't miss it. But the Jehovah Witness, as an example, and they're not the only ones. There's a bunch of these crazy cults that do the same kind of thing. They have some goofy leader 100 years ago that, do, that you know more about the Word of God than they do get up and try to lead a group of people to believe that somehow Jesus was born in heaven as if somehow God birthed some kind of son in heaven and birthed another son in heaven and they became rivals. And because Jesus won out, he got to be the savior and the other one got jealous and wanted to take Jesus away and became the enemy of Jesus. And then uh, Jesus kicked him out of heaven because Jesus was stronger and he became the devil and now he's roaming around here on earth. But he's really the brother of Jesus. Hogwash. If, you're, if you teach that, you're so ignorant. I mean, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But they use verse. This Bible says Jesus is the beginning of God. Yeah, it's because you don't know how to interpret the word. You don't use English words. You go back to the Greek. And the, and, and the word here is arche, A-R-C-H-E, transliterated into the, into the English language. You know what arche, arche means? It means, it, it, and I wrote it in your note, it means you, 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 are, you are the cause of an action. It doesn't mean Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. It means and like somehow Jesus came from the start and then from him things went forward after him. It doesn't mean, RK doesn't mean that. It means that Jesus was the original cause for the creation of God. RK means Jesus caused it to happen, not Jesus was the first and then things begin to happen after Jesus. It means Jesus is the cause for the origin of the, nation, of the, of the nature of this world. And you say, does that correspond with Scripture? Well, let me just quote one for you and you tell me. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was God, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And without Him was not anything made that was made. That all of creation was made through Him. And, and He became the light. And this light is the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld him as the glory of God the Father. Who's that talking about? It's talking about Jesus. So sure it does. Jesus was the original cause for every creation because the Bible says without him was nothing made that was made. So he's saying, look, who are we talking to you? Jesus Christ, the one who was the original cause for everything to be created. I mean, good night, man. What a revelation. What's right with the church? Absolutely nothing. This, whole, this church holds the dubious distinction of being the only church out of seven that nothing good was said about. Why goodness, it's, I mean like, hey, even at dead Sardis, even at dead Sardis, he says, there are few who haven't defiled their garments. <laughs> but at, at Laodicea, he doesn't even say, man, there's a few of you that are doing okay. There's nothing that he says good about this church. What's wrong? Let me get these to you real quickly. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Imagine it this way. Think about this. What is Jesus saying? He's just saying, I gave you several illustrations in your notes. You know, uh, what, if, what, if you're, what if you're a mechanic and you don't care anything about engines? Have you ever met a mechanic that's a true mechanic and they don't care anything about engines? They don't care anybody, anything about analog brakes or, or muffler systems or whatever. No, man, a real mechanic, when you start talking about those things, their eyes light up and it's blessed God, let's do it. And they're up on the things that are current and real and blah, blah. I mean, they're fired up about what they're, they're into. Or a banker that you carry in, you know, $500,000, you want to start an account. He says, oh, just lay it on the desk. I'll get to it sometime. You know, a banker that's not excited about uh, creating a new account and getting your money working for it and getting some of your money and all that. I mean, is there, is, could you imagine, you know, somebody, I'll just lay it on the desk, we'll get to it sometime. No passion about it at all. Could you imagine a doctor? Could you imagine a doctor that says to you, 
You walk in, you say, Doc, I feel sick, man. I'm just, uh, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. He says, All right, sit down over there. He gets his little stethoscope. Here's your heart, breathe. All right, breathe. All right, give me a thermometer, uh, uh, check your blood pressure, blah, 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 blah. And, and, then, and then he gets through with all that, and he's sitting over there with his little glasses pulled down, and he's writing on something, and he doesn't say a word to you. And you look at him, you say, uh, What about it, Doc? And he says, Hey, just pay your bill on the way out, would you? And then what would you say? You would look at him and you'd say, Well, what's wrong with me? I mean, I mean, look, uh, shouldn't you give me a prescription? Shouldn't I be taking some medicine? I mean, is, is what I got fatal? Is, do I need to, you know, pay attention? And do I need to, you know, do I need to, do I need to get some medicine? Is it catchy? Do, can people live with this? Can I walk around? I, I mean, you would say all that kind of stuff. And, and he, his response to you would be, um, well, yeah, yeah. I get, you know, I guess you could get all excited about that kind of stuff. Well, Doc, am I gonna, am I gonna die? And he just kind of casually looks over there and says, "Well, everybody's got to die, you know. I mean, come on." And it might as well be with the bubonic plague as it would be with heart disease or cancer. Just pay your bill on the way out, everything, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, can you can you imagine if you need some surgery? I'm your man, though. Can you imagine a doctor being complacent about disease? And not caring about what was going on with his patients and having no passion about anything to do. Just as casual, oh, um, well, everybody's got to die one day. Yeah. Well, that right there, yeah, that right there is exactly what Jesus is saying to the church. He's saying there are people dying all around you and the world's going to hell and all of that kind of stuff. And you're sitting there. Here, look like this. Here's Jesus Christ the Son of God standing right before you, the, the passionate one, the bright one, the brilliant one, the Son of Righteousness, the Lily of the Valley, the bright and morning star, the compassionate Jesus is standing there with his hands down and holes in his hand and blood running out of his side with a look of love on his face saying, let me come in, and you're so complacent, you're just going, well, I don't care. Yeah, maybe tomorrow. That's, that's just as senseless as the church not giving a hoot about Jesus or anything to do with him. And Jesus says to them, you're lukewarm. I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot. Now, this, uh, hot. now this might sound ridiculous, but he said, I wish you hated me. Or I wish you loved me. One or the other. But because you don't care, we, right, either way, you make me sick. And this world is full of churches that are hiding behind all these isms that ought to be wasm, fundamentalism. Some churches are so, you know, so, quote, righteous, they squeak when they walk. They don't care about anything or anybody, they just want to separate themselves and be isolated because they think separation means isolation and they don't want to interact with the world because they have all of the truth of God and the truth is going to die with them. And they, you know... Church full of occultism. I mean, it's ridiculous. You could go on the internet right now and watch, quote, churches. I saw one yesterday on, somebody sent Pastor Tanya some kind of something on Facebook or something. She, and she said, watch this. This is a church that somebody we know is going to. And I was sitting there watching it. And it was one of the biggest loony bins I've ever seen in my life. They had some freakazoid up there talking to people, talking about, you know, the Spirit said this, and come, and I'm getting the visions of this, and I'm getting this, and blah, blah, and he's talking about something, and somebody comes up there, and he puts his hand on them, and they just fall out and aisle, and they just twitch and wiggle, and all that. and this one over here is trying to get to be able to speak in tongues, and blah, 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 and this one's getting some gift of the Spirit, and walking, and this is the things of God, and it, it is a Wild West freak show. Nothing but occultism. Looking for some new spirit. Oh, God, maybe we have gold dust. Maybe we have eagle's wings. And I'm going, man, that is supposed to be a Christian church full of occultic incantations. Here's a, shot, a sideshow barker like a, Christ, like, a, like a circus performer running in three rings like Barnum and Bailey out there, barking the things of God, selling it to the merchandising people who somehow believe that that, that foolishness is something to do with God. Man, churches are full of it. Crusades are full of it. 
It's nothing but occultism. Looking for some new thing, some magic formula. I know you want to come to the altar and I put my hand on you and you get changed. I know you would love for me to pray for you and all of a sudden all of your problems be gone. I know you'd like to come to the altar and get a quote word from God and you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to discipline your flesh and co control your life, but that, that, that's, that's magic. It doesn't happen that way. Look, people come to me all the time and say, Pastor, I believe I have a demon and I'm, you know, this demon of alcoholism or this demon of adultery or this demon of, of drugs. I pray, cast it out of me, Pastor, cast it out of me. Look, you don't have a demon. You have a carnal nature. And if I cast out what was wrong with you, there wouldn't be anything but a greasy spot on that carpet because... <laughs> What's wrong with you is you. The Bible says you can't cast out the flesh. You discipline the flesh. You bring the flesh under control of the Spirit of God. It's not a demon that's got a hold of you. It's your carnal self that Jesus said you got to discipline the flesh. You got to control the flesh. You got to walk and turn away from the flesh. So it's not a demon that somebody can cast out because if we cast out what was wrong, you wouldn't exist anymore because you are what's wrong. Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm sorry. I'll just get off on a tirade. But that's what he's basically saying. And he said, here's your problem because you say I'm rich and I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing and you don't know that you're wretched, poor, blind, and naked and miserable. Man, there are churches all over that have no idea how far they are away from the Word of God. You know why? Because the Spirit of God is not even in there. And here's the sad part. They don't even know the difference. Oh, there were good entertainers. They're wonderful people. Listen, I I'm going to tell you. The church at Laodicea probably had a great location. I mean, when people drove by, it looked like a monument out on the side of Highway 49. I mean, it was wonderful. Some of you have seen that little monument right up here north of uh, 50, Highway 53 that, with a little flat, little, 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 little uh, uh, waterfall coming out called the City of David or whatever it is. Man, I mean, beautiful location. Couldn't have a better location than that. Wonderful orifice. Great, great look. Great campus. Great monument. It, had, it probably had a bunch of members. It had a big membership. It, therefore, it had a bunch of money because all those people gave money. And it, was, it, it, you know, it had its coffers full and the pastor was full time and the education person was full time and they probably had the greatest educational ministry and administration on the face of the earth. It was marvelous. All, man, the greatest singers, the greatest musicians, the greatest performers. The pastor could probably peach, preach the paint off the wall and every evangelist wanted to come there because the love offering was going to be, woo, gigantic. And they loved to come out and perform for all these big congregation of people with all this money and everything was good. They probably had the president of the bank as the church treasurer and probably some senator was the chairman of the deacons and they probably had some big industrialist as the treasurer of the church. They had everything you could ask for. They had the greatest of everything. They, they were proud and they were prosperous and they were powerful, but they were powerless before God because the Spirit of God does not inhabit those things. And the sad thing is they had all of this and they didn't even know that they didn't have Jesus because Jesus was no longer even in the house anymore. And nobody took a vote of all the church members and said, do we want to throw Jesus out? Everybody that wants to vote for Jesus not being a member anymore, raise your hand. No, there was no vote to vote Jesus out because it's obvious they didn't miss him. They didn't even know he wasn't there. He's, he's in a minute going to give us a picture of, hey, hey, I'm outside. I'm, I'm not in there anymore. If somebody will let me in, you'll open this door, I'll come in. In other words, it's like, does somebody hear somebody knocking on the door? What is that? See, they don't even recognize that they've lost him. 
And I'm just saying, look at the churches, man. Great performance, great preachers, great theology, great opportunity. You know, they're on TV. Everybody buys their albums, buys their records. They're loony as the idiots creating false atmospheres and false presentations and uh, smoke and gold dust and all kinds of craziness. Trying to bring people back to life, praying for them, and they die right there on the street and they have lawsuits against them because instead of calling 911 and getting some person out there with an inhaler that could stop this asthma attack, they just stood there and put their hands in, oh, in Jesus' name, right? until the person died on the street because they had the audacity to believe that foolishness. Good night alive. And that's the, and that's the gospel, that's the kingdom of God. God said, I'm not even within the area code of you. And the sad thing is you don't even know it because you think you're rich, but you are poor and don't even know it. You're blind and wretched and miserable. And the problem with you is you got eye problems. You only see yourself as the greatest and you don't even know I'm gone. Woo-wee. What was it, Smyrna? Smyrna said, you think you're poor, but you're really rich. And now to Laodicea, he says, you think you're rich, but you're really poor. And so he said, what do you need to do about it? I'll quickly give this kindly to you. I counsel you to buy, everybody say, from me. That's the key to this thing. The key to these quotes right here is you got to get them from Jesus. You can't get these things that he's about to say out of, the, out of the ATM. You can't buy them with money. Only Jesus can give them to you. He said, here's what you need to do. Get some stuff from me. All right, what do you need first? You need gold refined in the fire that you might be rich. I wrote in your notes a description of the city of Laodicea because the three things that the city was known for are the three things that he uses right here to speak to them. And you need to know what they were known for, so I put it in your notes. The city of Laodicea was known, first of all, as the banking center of the whole Asia, of the whole Asia Minor. They had big banks, and they were the kind of the center of the banking economy. And so he says, look, you have a lot of gold there in the city, but what I'm saying is you need to get from me the kind of gold that's been refined in the fire because you think you have riches, but it's only riches when it comes from me. So my counsel to you is quit trusting your money. You know, there are churches that think as long as they have plenty of money, everything's okay. Yeah. I mean, look, if people in the church give like they should, the church has an abundance of money. And people equate having an abundance of money as being okay with God. But according to Jesus here, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you have to get it from Jesus. Your money's not going to give you the Spirit of God. Only Jesus can give that to you. And then he says, and white garments that you may be clothed. One of the second industries, the thing that Laodicea was known for, is they had these black sheep. These black sheep had these long, shiny black uh, coats on them. And they would, they would you know, like, like you do with wool, they would shear those sheep and they would make material out of that black, shiny, glossy material. And they would make special garments out of that that were beautiful. And they were unique and they were different. And so God says to these people that clothe themselves with this black, shiny, glossy thing, you're naked. And, he, and he's speaking spiritually to them and he's basically saying, look, Uh, though you put on outer garments that you think make you look good, you are naked. You you have nothing clothing you. Your character, your your separation, your preparation, and I mean, you are naked before me. You're not clothed with the Spirit of God. You're not clothed with the power of God. You haven't put on the whole armor of God that you might stand against the devil. You're naked. So if you're gonna if you're gonna cover your nakedness, you're gonna have to get something from me. You're not gonna buy this. And then he said, you need some, 
You need to anoint your eyes with eye salve. The third industry that Laodicea was known for was the medical industry. The people at Laodicea had some doctors there that had created a salve that would soothe aching eyes and soothe aching ears. And so Jesus uses that and says, you know what you need to do? You need to take some of that eye salve that your doctors are, have grown famous for. And you need to put some on your eyes so hopefully the Spirit of God can open up your eyes and heal you. That's what he says my counsel is to you. If you want to quit being putrid and making me vomit, then you, these are the three things you need to do, and you need to get them from me, and you need to get serious with me right now. And then he goes on to say, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous. I'm just saying to you, if you're sitting here, and your heart's rumbling around, and you're feeling anxiety, and you're feeling discomfort, and you're, you're saying, oh God, don't let me be like that, you know, and, and I don't want to be lost and die and go to hell, and you're feeling all of that, it's because God loves you, and because the Spirit of God is challenging you. It's not because God wants to be mean to you. God wants to be angry with you. God wants to punish you somehow. It's because God loves you so much that he will, he will chase you to the end of the earth. Here, I'm going to tell you something. If God couldn't run faster than me, I would never have been saved. Because I was running away from God as fast as I could go running straight for the cliff that was going to run off my life. But God, because he can run faster than me, intercepted me ahead of me and convinced me he loved me. And if that I would surrender my life and bow my knee and confess that he was Lord, that he would change my life, change my soul, change my eternity, and change my destiny. And that's what he's saying to them. Because I love you, I chasten you. I, all you parents know this. You don't let your children run wild and do what they want to do. Why? Because children are ignorant, wild, undisciplined, out of control, immature. That's why they have to have parents. You don't need to be their friend. I don't know who needs to hear that, but somebody does. They got plenty of friends that are just as goofy as they are. They don't need a friend. They need a daddy. They need a mama to say, here's the point. And if you go past that point, you're going to have to be disciplined because I'm not going to sit here and watch you ruin your life. Right. And I only do that because I love you, not because I'm some, you know, control freak with, a, with, a, with anger issues. Because I care what happens to you. I love you. I want you to be prosperous. I want you to go forward, not because I'm some kind of micro control freak, but because I know what lies on the other side of that line, and I love you too much to let you go past that line. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you. And so, be, therefore, be zealous. And the last thing he says is, and repent. And that's funny because that's the last thing most of us will do is really repent. Oh, we'll confess. Oh, I did it. I'm sorry, Jesus. That's not repentance. That's confession. Oh, Jesus, I'll never do it again. That's not, that's not repentance. That's sorrow. Repent means to up, about, face, forward, march, move in the opposite direction. We'll cry. We'll wallow. We'll blow snot. We'll, we'll turn double back flips. We'll do everything we can do, and the last thing we will ever do is change our direction and walk in the other way because that takes discipline. And we're sorry and lazy and fat and happy and sassy and satisfied with ourselves. Blind as a bat to can't see that we're not walking toward the kingdom of God. We need to put some salve on our eyes and let the Spirit of God open up our eyes to, to the penetrating fire of the flame of Jesus Christ to challenge our lives. We are in Laodicea, and I'm sad to say to you, it's not going to get any better. I'm just trying to tell you how it is. It's not that you're going to do anything about it. The world is going, the church is going to get more worldly, and I'm telling you because we're in the Laodicea and church age, we're not going to be able to do a thing about it. These freaks and weirdos and kooks and these religious profiteers, these 54,000, no, oh, 54 million dollar jets, these 
these clowns that entertain people and call it the word of God, these, these, these uh, carnal performers that, that cast uh, magic miracles and, and goofy theology and ridiculous loony lives and these cults and these isms that ought to be wasms and everything else, they're going to thrive and get bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm just telling you what to expect. And that's not a challenge. I mean, that's not something that we say, okay, we can't do nothing about it. Let's just get in our little group and die and go on with Jesus. No, we're to challenge everything. But I'm just telling you, don't get discouraged when you don't see any changes because this is Laodicea. Welcome to the end of the world. And Jesus just wants us to know how, this is how it is. And because, you know, we've been through... Uh, the, the early church life. We've been through the suffering church life. We've been through the worldly church age. We've been through the, uh, through the uh, 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 idolatrous church age. We've been, the, we've been through the dead church age. We've been through the revival church age. And now we're in the Laodicean church age. Amen. As time marches through historical everything. So we're in the last days, baby. We're in transition. We're in that waiting for the shout and the voice of the archangel to be called home, which I'm going to preach about next week, by the way. Rapture realities. What is it all? And what does it mean? And how is it going to happen? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I've talk, talked about this enough. If you hear my voice, you open the door. Let me just show you this famous picture. This picture is, was painted by Holman Hunt. This picture hangs in sight in St. Peter's uh, Cathedral in uh, London right now. That's the picture right there. He painted that years and years and years ago. When that picture was put up in the, in the cathedral, some, uh, some person looked at it and said, Mr. Hunt, that's a beautiful picture, but you've made a mistake. And Mr. Hunt looked and he said, well, what's the mistake? Do any of you see the mistake on the picture? First thing I looked at is, did we hang that door? <laughs> I'm thinking, which one of our guys hung that door that it didn't have a handle, doesn't has a door, doorknob? That, that observer looked at it and said, Mr. Hunt, you've painted a beautiful picture, but there's a mistake, and the mistake is you didn't put a handle on the door. And Mr. Hunt said, that's not a mistake. The handle's on the inside. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Notice there's no handle on his side. The handle's on the inside because only you can open the door and go in. Now, Jesus was literally saying this to the church. Now, we've used it to talk to lost people, and it's a great passage to talk to lost people because the church at Laodicea is full of lost people. So in talking to the church, he's actually talking to a bunch of lost people. But he's actually talking to a church, and imagine that you're in that church, and Jesus is saying, I'm talking to the church. Let me in. It'd be like he's standing outside that door right out there, and he's knocking on the door, and we're all in here laughing and looking at the kingdom and worried about the world and blah, 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 blah. And he's out there knocking, going, can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? And we're just ignoring him because we don't even realize he's out there. That's Laodicea. Good choirs, great preaching, enthusiasm, all that kind of stuff, except Jesus is gone. And we don't even know it. Phew, yes. But anyway, we give you this last little passage. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me just explain that real quickly because you need to know this. This is theology, doctrine. This is, this is dispensational theology. Everybody say dispensational theology. All right, dispensational means that we believe that things happen in periods of time. You know, there was a period of creation. There was a period of covenant where God made a covenant with Abraham. There was the Davidic kingdom where God made uh, Israel the kingdom, represent the kingdom of God. Then there was the gospel age, which we're in right now. And then there's the age of uh, tribulation, which will be coming in the world in the age of the new. In other words, there are periods of time that are called dispensations. And when you say dispensational theology, it means you believe that, that there are certain periods of time where the Spirit operates in certain ways. And I just say all that to say that's what this is talking about here. And here, this is going to surprise you to know right now that Jesus is not sitting on his own throne in heaven. 
Huh? I know you're saying, oh, it says he sat down on the right hand of the Father. Yeah, but it doesn't say he sat on his throne. It said he sat down on the right hand of God the Father. God the Father has a throne. All the way from the beginning to the end, God has a throne. I'm just telling you there are two thrones. Most people don't know this and don't get all blown out of whack, but basically what this is saying is that there are two thrones. One of them is in heaven. It's the throne of God where God sits as the ruler of everything that has been created. And when Jesus went back to heaven, he sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God and he sat down on the right hand of God on God's throne. So that means in this dispensation of time, Jesus is ruling with God over all of creation. But he's not sitting on his throne. He's sitting on God's throne. That's what he says. He said, I sat on my Father's throne, and you're going to sit on my throne with me just like I sat on the Father's throne with him. Now, don't look at me, you know, as if I'm preaching some kind of heresy because it's all going to work out, all right? Hang on. Just, just know what I say. Do you remember what Gabriel said to Joseph and Mary when he told them about Jesus, read Luke chapter 1, get it started about verse 29, look at 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. And here's what Gabriel said to, to, to Mary. She said, look, you're going to have a son. The son's going to na be named Jesus. He's going to be the king of the generation and so forth. And he's going to inhabit the throne of David, of his father David. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And he shall rule and, work and reign forever. You know what the throne of David was? The throne of David. The king of Israel. There's a throne on earth one day in the millennial kingdom. See, Jesus is coming back to set up a kingdom on earth. I, I, I'll get into this more and more. But all I'm saying to you is right now, Jesus is sitting on the throne with the Father ruling over all the world. There's coming a day when he's going to have a throne sitting on earth. And there's going to be a kingdom established on earth during the millennial. And Jesus is going to sit on his own throne on the earth Scripture to back this up everywhere in the Bible. And he says, if you'll come with me, you can sit on my throne and help me rule over the kingdom that's here on the earth. He told his disciples, I got 12 other thrones that sit right by me, and you can sit on one of those thrones, each of you, and help me rule the millennial kingdom that's here on the earth. Oh, it's interesting. It's, it's unbelievable what lies ahead, guys. I'm just serious. But that's just theology, and that's what he's saying there. And, and, and basically the invitation is, now think about this. Think about the grace of God and the mercy of God, and think about the fact that to this lukewarm bunch that God's willing to vomit out of his mouth, the grace of God says to them, you're so, you're so lukewarm and tepid, you make me sick, but I'm still giving you a chance. I'm inviting you to come sit down on the throne with me because my grace is still alive right now. What an invitation. Uh -oh.